Hi everyone and welcome to this podcast recorded and produced by the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. This is one of a series of podcasts which really focus on hearing and sharing the career narratives of our diverse workforce and highlight a whole range of possibilities in occupational therapy. My name is Hannah Spencer and I'm an occupational therapist that's had the absolute pleasure and privilege of facilitating and capturing these conversations with members of our occupational therapy community. I'm here today with a member of our very much valued support workforce. So let's start with some introductions. Do you mind introducing yourself and your current role or roles? Yeah. My name is Olu from Laya Oludare, popularly known as Olu, O-L-U, because it's a long name. And presently, I'm an occupational therapy apprentice. Before now, I was the lead AHP support workforce for my trust. I implemented the uh, HEE uh, career progression framework for those class of support workers that align directly with AHP. But I have to step down so that I can complete my occupational therapy degree apprentice. And I'm currently in the third year and it's a four years program. So the purpose of today's conversation is around your career journey, uh, thinking about your career, your experiences in getting to this point. I found it helpful to use um, the analogy of career journey as a river to kind of guide that conversation and reflection. So uh, let's start right at the beginning. Yeah. What drew you to occupational therapy or to allied health? Can you pinpoint that source? How did it all start? I can just say possibly the the, the feelings, the gratitude that patients give to you on their journey. Let's presume the while I was a reablement support worker, and after doing your six week or four week intervention, and you see patients that they are unable to have their personal care and they are doing it independently. I always have the joy because the first day you you are handed over to support the patient, you see the look on the patient as if maybe you're not going to have a positive outcome. And within three weeks, they are settling in, they have integrated back into their community. That is just one of the things that I want to be part of this. I don't want to be that one of you are not part of the journey of the patient. So being part of the journey, empowering, and uh, supporting patients to do what they want to do, removing the barriers. I think that is what led me to develop further interest in uh, mm-hmm. occupational therapy because I've been in the generic role, working with the nurses and working with the physio. And I kind of like, who am I? <laughs> but I think eventually I resorted into being an occupational therapy apprentice which is just the best decision to me I have to be honest to you well well good to hear so you worked as a reablement support worker yeah I started off as a reablement support worker with the local authority and then that kind of be like a dual role because you do reablement you support the social social worker and at the same time the occupational therapy so it's like a dual role you are in the health sector and at the same time you are in the social care so I started off with a reablement officer. They call us officer, not support worker, with uh, one of the borough in London here. Yeah? And then uh, due to funding, we, they took us over to agency. But then I looked for a job in NHS, and I've been in NHS since 2018. So within NHS, I've worked as a reablement support worker again. From mm-hmm. reablement support worker, I moved to palliative care support worker. And that's a project that was in Pioneer in London where they said people were given the privilege to die wherever they want to. So I was supporting people at the last phase of their life, dying at their preferred place of death, which is home. So I did that from for some time and I'm like, I still felt that, yes, it's so emotional for me. I, I want to be in the journey of people that are not actively dying if there's anything I could do. Hence, I move forward and move to um, community rehab assistance. Mm-hmm. And in community rehab assistance is like an integrated team where you work with the physio, the OT. And our role is to prevent unnecessary hospital admit, uh, admission or act as a, a bridging between them. And from that, the journey commenced. I was privileged to do my foundation degree in health science, mm-hmm. a two-year course. 
And after the two years course, I was April to the occupational therapy apprentice because that was my preferred choice. I could have gone to nursing or other uh, qualification, other pathway, but mine was occupational therapy. And the reason I said to you earlier is that I like to be in the journey of recovery of people, removing the barrier and uh, allowing them to do what they want to do and when they want to do it. And I've been this person. Yeah. Can you tell me about a bit, a little bit about that that lead lead AHP support worker role? The lead AHP support worker role was first of its kind, and then within my trust, it wasn't easy when I commenced the role because, like I said to you, support worker we are spread all over, and that was when I did the scoping exercises. And within our trust, we have people that are actually supporting that they are like twenty different names. Like my role when I was supporting, I said to you, when I was supporting, they gave me a posh name within my trust. They gave me community rehabilitation assistant practitioner. And there are some, they are just rehab assistant. There are some, they are called hybrid worker. There are some, they are called bridging worker. So we, we have different roles. Some are called clinical support worker. And that was one of the problems I had that, how can you implement change if you don't even know those people? So for us to be able to implement change, we need to know who are those support workers aligned with AHP. Hence, I did the scoping exercise by starting up doing a questionnaire and sending it to those type of staff that are aligned with AHP. And the funnest aspect, the first set of results I have is some of them don't even know that they are aligned with AHP. Mm -hmm. And some of them have the difficulty to say, who am I, just like myself, I said to you earlier, or, who am I? Sometimes I see myself as a nursing assistant assisting the MS specialist nurse because my team was integrated. So we did the scoping exercises. We realized those support workers that they are aligned with AHP. And then the voice of support worker is they needed that voice. They needed that language so that they can have access to CPD and that registered practitioner. Um, and uh, the, at the uh, end of it, we have support worker falling in three categories. The end of the scoping exercise is uh, some of them are like Olu, that they are looking into career progression. Mm -hmm. And some of them are like not looking into career progression. And some of them are looking into training. They want to feel more confident in their roles. So we took it forward. And I said to them at my workplace that we need to, scope further we don't want to leave. but before i took the role i said to the director i don't want this role to be a tick box exercises i want a sustainability because nhs do advocate for sustainability but sometimes mm -hmm. it's just by the book and the director laughed that okay so hence as a result of work i've done the role is not a sustainable post in my trust so the, so that they can build on the legacy that i've created so as i've said to you we have three class of mm -hmm. ten from the support worker, the scoping, we have three endpoint results. Those that are like only looking to career progression, how can we help them to have the required qualification, their eligibility, we look at it, and the suitability, because a lot of them that have engaged with, they say, I want to be an occupational therapist. And we have to look at, do you have that KSB, the knowledge, the skill, and the behavior that we allow you to go into that pathway successfully. Because it's so upsetting. A lot of us started the program and some people drop off because they don't have that knowledge of what it entails. So if they don't have that knowledge, how can we help them to be able to have that knowledge? Hence, I, I develop what they call an end route mentoring and coaching to prepare them ahead of the, what is to come. And we have a leadership program for the support workers because a lot of support workers, we have what they call low self-efficacy. Like me, I have a very low self-efficacy just because we don't have that continuous training that the registered practitioner have. So the second phase of the people is those people that just need their training. Because before we used to, uh, when I was a enablement support worker some few years back, when we are writing notes, we write it on papers, but now, Everything is online. Everything is, you have to have a laptop. We do agile working. So some of them are not competent to use laptops. So they just need training for them to be able to write their notes. They need training for them to do so online training. They don't want to go. They are happy being a support worker. So those are the second phase. And the third people are people that they are like, no, they are not looking for career progression. They don't want training. So I put a focus group to explore. Why don't they want training? Why are they contented? 
in that position. And the result is that they are in their 60, they are 65, they are approaching retirement. So what I said to the uh, director is after I've done the scoping, how can we validate the choices of these people? Because they have soft skills. These people in their 60, 65, they are the ones that have been training our band six, band seven, how can we validate them? So hence we put something together for them to do AHP day within our trust to recognize them, to mm -hmm. say thank you to them, for to say thank you for giving us so, those soft skills. I went for my six week placement. With that support worker, I may be lost in the team, but I was glad to see that I have rehab assistant. I was gluing to the rehab assistant more than the registered practitioner. And the, my practice educator kept saying to me, oh, you are a student, you are not a support worker. And I'm like, I'm a support worker. I'm proud to say that I'm a support worker because I learned from support worker and I'm still a support worker. So those are the results of the scoping exercise and they are building on the legacy. And one of the things I did in my time doing the role is that it's not what the trust one, it's what is the thing that the support worker is looking for? Mm -hmm. What is it that matters to them? So if I don't do the scoping exercises, we, we've been looking at just implementing it, but some support worker just want to have their level five. Mm -hmm. which was what I had for level five gave me different perception. I have to be honest. And I say to everybody before having the privilege to go to uni, I, I used to be a copy and paste support worker. What does that mean? You, a registered practitioner, will say, oh, you go and deliver a working frame. Yes, I will adjust the working frame. I will look at it, it's height adjustable, and I will walk away, have some conversation with them. But going to university and doing my one of the module public ed, I realized that it's not only nurses that do ed promotion. I do, I do, I use this um, framework, MECC, make every contact count. I mm -hmm. have a very good conversation with them. How are you? this and that, your medication, if they say to me they've taken the medication, they have a blister pack, I will look at it. Have they really taken the medication? Because some of them are dementia. They may think they've taken the medication. So if they are struggling to take the medication, I will reassure them that I'm going, are they happy for me to let the nurse in charge? No, because we work in an interprofessional way. And I, I ask them, are they drinking water? And I go to Costco, I buy this 40, 40 pieces of this is three pounds something, three quid. I buy it, I put it in my bag. And when I'm doing my visit, I'm ensure I'm drinking. And I'm like, are you drinking enough water? Mm -mm, oh, I don't like water. Now we take the conversation beyond why you need to drink water. If your washing machine is plugged, to the water and there's no water. Will you wash? They say no. So also your kidney needs filtration. And I tell them when you drink water, it's good for your skin. It's good for you to drink adequate water. Your medication that you are drinking need water to dissolve so that it can work. If you drink enough water, if you are not drinking water, you are prone to have a low blood pressure, which may make you to have a fall. And if you have a fall, you end up in the hospital. And those are the type of conversation that I do with patients. By the second time I'm seeing them, they are saying, oh, I'm drinking water. <laughs> so this is where we start off from because they know why. But as a rehab assistant, most of the time we are a copy and paste. But now, giving that opportunity for, for me to do my level fives. So some people want to stop at level five and some people don't want it at all. So that's why I say I'm an advocate. What can we do for people to have regular CPD? And that is why I'm here today to make people feel belong. And when you feel belong, you will be able to deliver high quality care. Absolutely. To be the best you can be. Yeah, absolutely. And I hear there in your answer um, that actually you know, some members of our support workforce do want to go on to train to be to be become registered members of staff. But yeah. equally, some members of our support workforce are quite content within the support workforce, but are still entitled to that development and progression. And, and that's really important, too, isn't it? Yes. Um, so what do you love about your role, uh, both in the present day and over the course of your career journey? OK, let me go through the flow. <laughs> okay, go through the flow. As, as, as a rehabilitation uh, support worker, no two days are actually the same. Mm -hmm. No two days. So uh, I love able to meet people, to talk to them. And because I'm, I've am i been here 20 years, and but people see, see me as an African person. People ask me, where are you from? So sometimes it can be so challenging for me. So I, 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 I like able to meet people and able to let them know that it's not about me. I say to them that I may be all at work, 
but maybe at home I'm John. It doesn't matter. I like the ability of being my authentic self to work. I don't want people to see me as Olu. I want to be my authentic self. And that is what I've been able to have. Okay. So I, when I start my job, I kick it off by saying, my name is a three letter word, Olu. What is your name? What do you want to be called? Because sometimes people may be Jane in book, but when they want to talk to me, they say, Olu, I'm, I'm John. So I embrace the John and I go along with the John. So that is why I like people. I use my therapeutic self to connect with people honestly and say to them anything we discuss so far, you are not saying you're going to kill yourself. It's just going to make me to be able to deliver care to you. That's why I like the job. And now I work as an OT apprentice within the community learning disability. Oh my God. First day, they am like, what am I doing here? Because these people, 80% of the people on our caseload, they are non-verbal. And the beauty is being non faba they could connect with me. So that makes me to go for further training that how could I connect with these people. So seeing them giving me a smile, it's warm up my heart. Seeing them holding me and waving at me, even they can't talk and they can still see me that I'm a person and I'm helping them in their journey. So it's just about you being able to allow people to do what they want to do. I know it's not automatic being an agent of change. I know some people open the door for us, but occupational therapy ensure that the door is not closed. Uh, the door only closed when you really need the door to close. So that, 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 that giving people life, so being mm -hmm. an agent of change, that is what I like and seeing people happy, not people that can speak, but people that they are non-verbal. That is the part that warm up my heart, giving me a all exchange the eye contact and when I come in they make a sign to me and I'm like I smile to embrace them that I can acknowledge your sign so that's a bit that I like in the I love that I love that you can hear your passion for your role <laughs> as you, in your answers it's brilliant thank you what about challenges along the way what have been yeah, the boulders the, kind of getting in your way yeah especially during the lead AHP support worker role mm -hmm. and a lot of people did not want to engage because they believe it's just one of those things that change is not going to happen. So, and one thing I've seen is that you, it's not a one approach, like being a lead AAP support worker, you can't just send email to people. It's good to meet people. Like I use this medium. I used to do a peer support meeting where I will meet them on, uh, on Teams and I will tell them that this is confidential, but if it's beyond me, I'm going to take it further so that you can get the outcome. So challenges can be overcome by being flexible. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been to a lot of training. I've been on emotional intelligence training for me to be able to control my emotion and at the same time not to have a misconception so those are the means of is for re having adequate reflection and being being open supervision is a is a is, is a way for you to break barriers having supervision section to your with your supervisor and be honest and one of our, of our trust policy we have to, uh, trust and values we have five one of them is pre being professional and honest. Mm -hmm. There's no how you will deliver your role if you are not honest and professional. Like when I was doing the uh, palliative care, patients are dying, but they say to me, oh, look, tell me what is happening. Am I dying? And I can't just say to them, you are not dying or you are dying. So it's about how do we communicate the language? How can we be together? So what I do is that a lot of reflection, a lot of supervision, because sometimes I will look at the registered practitioner that, oh, they are not feared. They are doing this to me. So instead of me complaining about people, why can't I look it from my, my another lens of my supervision, reflection? And to have a good resort, to overcome barriers sometimes, not one method fits all. Some people want to see you in person, just to see you face to face. Some people want to talk on the phone. Some people, you just have to follow up. What I said to my manager is that follow up, follow up, follow up. But when you are following up, we have to be mindful of the language that we are using. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be authoritatively. Our language should be in a, come across as a friendly, but not using one approach. That is how I have overcome challenges, supervision, reflection, my language, and no one size fits all. We will get there. It's not automatic, but we will get there. 
and that sings of occupational therapy values as well doesn't it seeing a person as an individual with individual needs and uh, skills and experiences as well yeah yeah uh how has your environment around you kind of enabled or restricted your career journey do you think yeah before this uh, movement i call it movement before this uh, lead AHP support worker role we are just support worker and okay. i say a lot of support worker with their environment when when we had the covid-19 when we were deployed they will just want to do the bare minimum they said they are not recognized and they use this and oh i'm just a support worker and i'm like yes we are support worker bet we can so sometimes the environment where we work can restrict because of funding mm-hmm. and because there's no framework to implement. But now with the AHP support worker role, the next phase of the project that I've done that I'm still supporting them but because I'm the Northeast London apprentice and representative within Northeast London mm-hmm. is about having that competency that is aligned with their role. And I, I did a presentation for its care certificate. You know, care certificate is the minimum standard for any support worker to practice mm-hmm. in this country. But what I realized, I did my 2018. Within the course of time, I seen that it's just become a tick box exercises. And if you look at the standard, if people can follow it chronologically, we will be able to deliver high quality care. But if it's a tick box exercises and there's no framework to to align support worker to it, there will be limitation. Mm -hmm. So it's all about having a framework that supports the role of a support worker and somebody to like checks and balance. Because if there's no check and balance, you just want me to do it, I will just do it. Like me, when I write my note as the as from band two support worker, I know what is mental capacity at, and I know why I should act in the best interest if a patient cannot give me consent. And that is a part of care certificate. Uh, the one thing I've not said to you is I'm so passionate. And where is the passion coming from? In Africa, in Nigeria, I've been here 20 years. We don't have that health care. You don't, we don't have that health care. We don't have NHS in Nigeria. Okay. So you need to be able to afford the health care. So when I wow. see people, when I see people, and, and one of the big codes that have actually influenced me, and I delivered this nationally during the December support worker voice. And that code that I put in one of my slides is that of Desmond Tutu, that somebody has to go upstream. Why are people going downstream? And seeing people dance for me used to affect me mentally. So I, when I go to people, I adopt the MECC, make every contact count. If I can talk to them, engage with them in meaningful conversation, I'll be able to support them in letting them make good lifetime choices that will not allow them to go to damn stream. Because what I see with my journey as a support worker, I see Mrs. A today. In the next six months, six weeks, Mrs. A is discharged. In the next three months, Mrs. A is back. So how can I be an agent of change by knowing what to say to Mrs. A to prevent her going downstream all the time so that she can have a quality of life? In Mm -hmm. Africa, we don't have this. What we do in Africa is we are so knitted together. So it costs money for support worker to be going out there. So support worker too, if we have CPD that is aligned to our role, we can support the registered practitioner like yourself to be an advocate of lifestyle choices. So hence, we are, that is where this passion, the energy is coming from. I think my, my world view Mm-hmm. or my personal view of life. I think so often people think that skills and experiences come from workplace roles, but it's our life experiences too, isn't it? And they yes, make so us who is, we yes, are. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. sharing that. Thank you. Thank do you, you. Do you feel like you've been able to be or to bring your best self to, to occupational therapy, to allied health? Yes, yes. I have. I'm I'm un- I'm unstoppable. When I'm somewhere, I walk myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. You want to go on access visit? Because I said to them, I'm a sponge. So when I go anywhere, I go as a sponge. I remove my hat as if I'm something, and I will tell them the day my first day on the wall, they say, Oh, are you not Olu? 
that you did this speech? I said, which Olu? I, I don't want them to see me as maybe that post a leader. No, we are in it together. So I've been able to move around, be my authentic self. And if anything is not right, I have reflection mm -hmm. and I have a mentor. And that's why I say to support worker that believe in yourself. The person that can stop you from being, bringing your authentic self to work is the person you see in the mirror when you groom yourself. So why would you want to stop yourself? The only person that can stop you is the person you see while you groom yourself. Because there's a wrong perception that we say, oh, the environment is not supporting me. Why can't you adapt the environment? The environment wasn't supportive to me. There are a lot of resources on Earth Education England that are for support workers. That was what I was doing to increase my knowledge, my skill, to prepare me for what is to come today, to be an occupational therapy. So nobody can stop us taking our authentic self. It's only the person you see in the mirror that can stop you. So work on yourself and the whole world will be what we want it to be. Like the change stands from me. This change is me. The change mm -hmm. I want to see my patients. I can't tell my patient drink water. If I'm not drinking water, I can't give what I don't have. So when the change starts from me, there can be a movement. Hence, when I took the leadership role, I said, I don't want it to be a tick box exercise. Hence, we have it now. The legacy is there within my trust that they know that they need that lead AHP support worker that can connect with somebody that is called support worker so that they can have an identity. Sometimes mm -hmm. I see some patients and I say to them, hi, my name is Olu. And they look at my Heidi Kai, occupational therapy. Some people say, you are a rapist. And that's, I'm like, rapist? And I'm like, why is he saying that to me? But that place, I switched my mode of communication that, sorry, sir, I've come to support you with this. So I won't take it personal and say, oh, he called me rapist. So it's just about us being prepared. Ch so changing your perspective. Thank you. And um, that will make you to bring your authentic self to, to work. Mm -hmm. And I've heard as well, what's really important to you is living your values. My values. Yeah, my values. Living and, and working to your values, your own yeah, values. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it influences. So sometimes our work view can be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. It's not about knowing your, your limitation and knowing the clinical reasoning behind what we are doing a lot of places now they are looking for OT but if the support workers that have been on the job for a long time if they can do reskilling retraining upskilling will we be in a better place that that really important question in all of our toolbox is asking why and, and keeping your critical thinking and always asking why why true yeah. true What's been most important or helpful for you in your development and progression as a member of the support workforce? Networking. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Where have you had opportunities to network? When I secured that role as a lead AHP support worker, I send an email to people that I know they are the first people to do the role. If I'm not part of network, I will have lost. Networking is so important i wanted that i see for a support worker that give me that self-efficacy is language okay language and professional identity to be able to identify with something we don't just want to we are there but sometimes we are not seen so mm -hmm. being able to network have that language and professional identity i say to people yes i'm ota assistance if most time I don't even remember I'm a student. So I don't mm -hmm. use the lead role because I went to do a, a, a presentation and the our director was saying, oh, she's band five. And after it, a lot of people run to me and say, oh, oh you didn't tell me you are band five. So I don't want people to see my banding. Yeah. And that is one of the problems I have in my early days that always affected. We've lost a lot of fantastic support worker because when the registered practitioner wants to introduce, they say, oh, she's our band two. And mm -hmm. I've come to put to you today that an OT assistant, NHS is not about banding, it's about potential. And that was the first thing. We've all got potential, but that language matters. So when they realize, because during my lead role, I don't say to them, I'm a band five. 
So they ran to me in the break. Oh, so you are back five. You didn't tell us no. I said to them, we are support worker because if you are on the same page with them, they will feel free to talk to you, to tell them their troubles and you'll be able to reassure them because most times I don't have the answer. So networking is so important, the language and having a mentor because mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people, they even have their first degree in psychology during my scoping essays and I'm like, you can go and do your level six, they are like, uh, masters, they are like, oh, I can't. So those people, they've lost their trust or confidence, but if they have a mentor in the workplace that they can hold on to, pending the time that they wake up, their mojo comes out, we won't be lo losing staff or staff will be able to perform in their, uh, in their maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. to be able to have that cap uh, capability and capacity so those are the things that have, i think that have changed my world i'm being honest to, when i can't do something i tell you i'm sorry i can't but i want to learn hence i'm a sponge and i'm i'm, I'm absorbing anywhere i go to it's brilliant and that sense of belonging as well it ha it naturally belonging. impacts on our effectiveness doesn't it and our sense of well-being our sense of yes. self yeah yes. What do you wish you'd known before you joined the support workforce? What would you say now to your younger self? What I've not said to you is that in Africa, I did accounting and I was actually working in the banking sector. So one thing I... Quite different. <laughs> yes, I was, an, I was an accountant. But coming here, being a mother, my words change. So one of the concepts in accounting is TQM. So TQM, Total Quality Management. And that concept... The TQM consent, total quality management, is getting it right first. So as I'm being inducted into healthcare, giving me those training, having somebody to sit with me, Olu, what is important to you? So that, you know, within, within the healthcare, you see some support worker that they, are, they, they don't have that um, education. Some of them, they don't have the why doing it. And before you, before you know it, we all start doing the same thing and there's something there's an there, there, there's a there, there's i don't know whether it's, uh, it's french they say argument to add the populous because the whole population are doing something does not make them to be right but mm -hmm. because we are not school we just follow suit so i would have loved to have this opportunity 15 years ago Give for me. somebody to say oh oh look this is a b c that you need to do to get to d mm -hmm. So seeing, but seeing pathways easy. and opportunities, having yeah. mentorship. Yeah, mentorship. Yeah. Yeah. Proper induction, proper okay. induction, having that networking. I will, uh, it will have been, I will have been better, but I'm glad that I still have the opportunity. This is like I'm living my second life. The first one was when I did my accounting and being an occupational therapy is what I've always wanted to do. In the banking sector, when customers come, I don't just look at their account balance back in Africa. I talk to them, how are you doing today, Mr. A? What happened to your wife? You do come to the bank with your wife. Why are you alone? Then I was practicing as occupational therapy in the banking sector. <laughs> but in Africa, for a father to be happy or a mother to be happy, they want to hear that, oh, my daughter is an accountant. My daughter is a lawyer. So it's the is your parent that decide what to be, want to be. Your parent decide your career pathway. Okay. The amount of doctor you have in your family shows your reputation in the community. Hence, I did accounting. It's not that I like figures. Yes, I like figures because that transferability helped me in the ESL when I was doing our ESL. That transferable skill allowed me to work on the spreadsheet. So that transferable skill in accounting helped me. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But in the banking sector, I've been doing occupational therapy. Why are you working that way? What happened to your leg? Have you been to your doctor? And I said to you, doctors are not free. We don't have NHS. So giving me this opportunity now, I'm grateful. But my younger self will have like, oh, get somebody to network with, somebody to hold my hand, somebody to show me that for you to get to D, you need A plus B plus C, not mm -hmm. just doing the try and error. You can hear that your care and your compassion and your genuine curiosity and, and concern yeah. for people. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, been, that's been right there from day one, hasn't it? Yeah, true. Yeah. Where's next for you? 
oh, completing by this time next year, I will be counting months to complete my program. <laughs> I will do what I would love to do to be registered as an occupational therapy, but at the same time, I'm still the support worker because an, as an occupational therapy, we support patients in promoting their health and well-being. Grateful for being in United Kingdom for 20 years. So next phase of my life is to bring on board those knowledge, the skills and the behaviors that I've acquired during my training to put it into practice and to support other people. To do the on, same. Yeah, yes. Or not to, for them to have a language, for them to have an identity and not to give up, to keep doing. We have a lot of amazing support worker. And I will try my best in, within my trust for them to be able to identify with uh, with uh, our COT. So having an, oh, an associate for our COT. I'd like you to finish my sentence for me. Um, Being part of the occupational therapy support workforce is... Being part of the occupational therapy support workforce has allowed me to have professional identity and visible presence within the community of practice. Yes, giving me professional identity and I'm visible. Like where I said to you that um, a lot of support worker, we have that glass ceiling. But belonging to a network make you to be visible and uh, belong to a community of practice. They see us as an individual that has the potential, not just a band too but we have a potential to complement, to be an integral part of the fantastic registered practitioner. Absolutely, a very much valued and vital part of the workforce. Yes, thank you. Thank you for talking to me today, Olive. Thank you so much. Sir.